disappointed. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, <clears throat> we'll get right into it here. Uh, the Bible says in verse 1, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God, the Lord God your, uh, of your fathers, giveth you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Now, it's a great principle right there in verse 2 where it says, You shall not add unto the words which I command you, and you shall not diminish aught from it either. You know, that tells us a couple of things. And one, that you know, God doesn't, you know, doesn't take his word lightly. What he says, you know, he, he says what is sufficient. And uh, he doesn't appreciate people tampering with his word. And we see a lot of that today, don't we, with all these false versions and things that are out there that people are adding to and diminishing aught from the Word of God, removing verses, you know, whole, whole sections of Scripture, changing it, adding to it, manipulating the Word of God. You know, and God isn't going to hold those people guiltless. You know, their part, the Bible says, shall be removed out of the book of life. You know, that's, that's one thing that God really draws. A, you know, he draws a lot of lines, and that's a real particular one that he draws pretty deep and says you should not do this. So that's one way you can look at that. But another way that you could look at that is the fact that, you know, we should not add unto the word and we should not diminish it from, from it in the sense that, you know, from in our own teaching. You know, those that would preach or get up and teach God's word, you know, we should make sure that the things that we're teaching and preaching, commanding of the word of God are of the word of God and nothing more. <clears throat> you know, we shouldn't get up and start adding other things to the word of God or adding the traditions of men and teaching for the tradi uh, the traditions of men for the do or teaching the traditions of men for the uh, the doctrines of God. We shouldn't get up and teach tradition like it's something that God commands. I mean, we can all have preferences, we can all have things that we like done a certain way or principles or things that we think are best done, but they're not clearly lined out in scripture where we can say it's you should or should not do this. And there's areas, there's gray areas, there's areas where we can have preferences, but we should never get up and preach our preferences as commandments and say, it's this way. And without a clear scripture, everything that we teach and believe should be based on clear scripture. And if you don't have clear scripture, you know, what do you have to stand on? You know, it might just be your opinion. It just might be some tradition. It just might be something false that you were taught even. I mean, <clears throat> and, and it... Here's the thing. I mean, hasn't God given us enough to keep track of as it is? I mean, the Bible's got a lot of do's and don'ts in it. The Bible's got a lot of rules. You know, we don't need to sit, sit there and make up new rules and try to add to the Word of God and try to lay even a more of a burden on, 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 on ourselves by adding to God's Word and His commandments. So we shouldn't be adding to the burden. You know, there's plenty there for us to get right and to keep right and, and, and to work on. But at the other hand, you know, then people go to the other extreme, don't they? Then they start excusing people. They might not be adding on to the commandments of God, but they like to diminish aught from it. They like to say, well, you know, I know this is what the Bible says, but, you know, you don't really necessarily, that's, that's the Old Testament, or, you know, we're under grace. So they'll have all kinds of different excuses for whatever, uh, you know, particular commandment they have a problem with, that they'll actually start excusing other people from their God-given responsibilities. You know, they'll, they'll start diminishing aught from the Word of God. So we don't want to do either, you know, we don't want to add to the word of God, but we also, we don't want to diminish from it either. We want to make sure that we're, you know, we're teaching the whole counsel of God and, and not leaving anything off and, and again, not adding anything to it. So a great principle right there in verse two, he goes on and says in verse three, your eyes have seen what the Lord had done, uh, what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, uh, the Lord God, thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land where you go to possess it. Keep, therefore, and do them. For this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God in all these things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? And, you know, that goes to show us, and we have to be reminded of the fact that God intended Israel in the Old Testament to be a light unto the Gentiles. He intended them to be a testimony of God to the whole world. 
that the, the, the Gentile nations would look unto Israel and would become believers and followers in the one true God. That they would, they would look and, and, and have this same reaction that's described here. They would say, what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them <clears throat> as the Lord our God? And what nation is so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous is all this law? I mean, people should be looking at those that teach and represent God and his law, and they should be in awe of it. They should be in awe of the righteousness of the law of God. Now, is that what we see today? Do we see people looking at the Bible and reading it and saying and being in awe of the book of Leviticus? Are people in awe of the book of Deuteronomy? Are they in awe of the book of, you know, the five books of Moses? And awe, are they in awe of, of the whole of scripture and all the statutes and the judgments and the, and the law that God gives in his word? Do they call it righteous? Do they say this is good? Do they say, wow, this is really something, you know, what nation is so great? Well, this is so wise. What an understanding people that believe these things. That's not what they do today. They mock and they scoff and they ridicule and they and they they don't exalt the word of God, you know. And, they, and obviously, there's no nation that's following and keeping, you know, and practicing the laws that are given out in God's word. But that was the, the intent of Israel in the Old Testament that they would they would live by the word of God, and they would have a, a, a society based upon the word of God, and that other nations would look on it and say that nation's got it right. And that's the thing. If if we had a nation that, and, and you know, America is loosely based on the Bible. A lot of it, you know, there's a lot of principles and things that we have from the from the Bible that our forefathers, you know, tried to put into into our in our uh, you know our government. And uh, you know, for that reason, we do to some degree experience you know greater liberty than a lot of other nations. Even to the little bit that our nation still observes the statutes and the judgments of God, we benefit from that. You know, not to the degree that God would intend a nation to benefit from his word, but it's there. It does happen. And it's showing us here that if a nation would embrace the word of God, if a nation would embrace the law and the commandments and the statutes and the judgments of the Bible, that it would be such a wonderful thing. That nation would be so wise and understanding that the other nations around it would look at it and say, this is amazing. Truly, this, this nation has the, the, the Lord God as their God. This is the true and living God. That's what God intended for Israel. And it also shows us, and if you would, go ahead and turn over to uh, Psalm, 9, Psalm chapter 9. Of course, keep something there in Deuteronomy. <clears throat> that was God's intent for Israel. And it also shows us that, you know, it's God's law that exalts a nation. It's not the nation itself. You know, if a nation is exalted and lifted up and becomes mighty, you know, it's, it's, it's usually directly related to how much they observe God's law. Now, you know, we're also living in a time where, you know, uh, nations are being lifted up for other reasons. They're, they're powerful, like, like the United States. But when God exalts a nation, it's because they're exalting God, if that makes sense. And the Bible says that the law of God is perfect. It's, it, the testimony of the Lord is sure. The statutes of the Lord are right. You know, we should, there should never be anything in the word of God that we're ashamed of. Then we should back away and say, and then someone say, well, you believe this? And turn us to a pastor and say, you believe that? And you go, well, yeah, maybe, yeah, well, and try to explain it away. You know, diminish ought from it. Or try to add unto it and say, well, you got to understand back then. And, and try to explain something away. There's no part of the Bible that we should ever back down and be ashamed of. Amen. We should be able to embrace the whole thing. The Bible says, happy is the people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is the people whose God is the Lord. If we had a nation that embraced the Lord, that embraced the statutes and the judgments of the word of God, they would be a happy people, the Bible says. The Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And let me tell you something. We are living in a country that is putting off the word of God. To whatever degree we had embraced it in the past, we're, we're moving away from that. We're casting off the word of God. They're banning the word of God. They've kicked God out of the public schools. They've kicked God out of the public you know, courts. They've kicked God out of the public square every chance they get. They don't want to mention anywhere. And you know what's happened? It's turned this nation into a reproach. I mean, look at the things that are going on in our country. The wickedness and the vile, disgusting filth that's being exalted in this country right now and paraded up and down our streets and promoted up throughout the whole world. You know, that's a reproach to this people. We, that, you know, that's a reproach to the United States of America. 
to those that have woke, you know, that have woken up to the truth and, and are brainwashed by the media and can unsee it for what it is, those that understand righteousness and truth and holiness, they we look at the filth that's going on in this nation and it's a reproach. It's 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 disgusting. You know, uh, you know, Brother Fabian, we're out soul winning today, and he's telling me about these Halloween directions the decorations he said he sees now he saw this one in this house where it was clearly something that some kids made you know they do that in schools they'll build certain types of the year they'll you know thanksgiving they put their hand on the paper and they make the turkey in school and they bring it back you have the turkey decoration and they do all these everything well halloween you know sometimes they, they have the kids make halloween direct decorations and on this house there's this hand-drawn little cross upside down you know the kid probably didn't know what they were doing but, you know, that's where we're at, where kids don't even understand that they're just mocking the things of Christ, mocking the things of God. It's wicked, and it's a reproach to any people when we cast off the word of God. Look there in Psalm 9, where it says in verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God, every single one of them. There are no exceptions here. You know, we're not, just because we're in the United States, and, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm glad to be in this country. There's no other country I'd rather be in. And I'm thankful for the freedoms that we still have and pray that we can still use them and, and preserve them. But a nation that forgets God, no matter who it is, even our own nation will be turned into hell. That's what the Bible says. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thine sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. See, people want to get all excited about, you know, rah, rah, you know, this country, that country. And what they forget is that a, a, a nation, a country, you know, this, this idea of patriotism, all it is at the end of the day is it's just men. It's just man. It's just representing mankind. And men, you know, are not, aren't the greatest thing in the world. You know, they do a lot of wicked things. They do a lot of terrible things. And, you know, national pride, when I read the scripture here in other places as well, you know, I don't see national pride being a concept in scripture where we should have, have this nationalistic pride. You know, I just don't see it. And, and I, I and it, you know, I'm welcome to be corrected on that. Someone could show me and say, hey, this is where we should, the Bible says that we should, you know, be patriotic and, and, and pledge our allegiance and loyalty to a nation. You know, we should, we should pledge our allegiance to Christ and his kingdom you know and if we live in a nation that exalts God then great let's get behind that and that's something that maybe we could you know take us you know if I could say a sense of pride maybe you know or we could be grateful for that we live in a country that exalts the righteousness but here's the thing we're not we're not living in a country that exalts holiness and righteousness and godliness we're not so why would I get all excited about the United States why would I start waving flags and you know, putting the stickers on my car and pounding my chest about the United States. This country's got a lot of blood on its hands, people. A lot. And it's a wicked country, and it's casting off God. And it's moving away from the scripture. And it's moving away from the things of God. And the Bible says that sometimes nations, they just need to be judged and put in fear so that they understand something, that they're just men. That at the end of the day, we're just men. <clears throat> and that's why I don't, you know, I'm not a big proponent of you know, and, and people, again, I'm not, this is preference. You know, this is, I'm not trying to say you shouldn't vote, but I'm not a big proponent of it. You know, I don't think that God's blessing is going to be found through a ballot box. I just don't. I don't think you're going to go and vote this country into, into righteous living. You're not going to vote this country into embracing the Bible. You know, it's going to be kept, that's going to happen when God's people keep God's commandments. And we go out and we win souls and teach others these things. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, I, I hate being pessimistic, but sometimes I wonder if we're just a little bit past the tipping point, to where it's kind of maybe too late, where all we can do now is just kind of hang on and we're about to go for a ride with this country and just, you know, and we do what we can along the way. So if you came to be uplifted tonight, <laughs> you're in the wrong place, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, this is the reality that we're living in. This is where we're at in this country. We're in a country that's, I mean, do I have to get up here and re rehearse every, and remind everybody what's going on out there? I mean, it's insane what's going on out there. Just in the short time that I've been alive, 
you know, when I was growing up in junior high and things like that, today, till today, you know, the course of 20 something years, all right, maybe 30 years, but you know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's just taken off. This country, it's gone mad. It's because people have cast off God. And uh, you know, we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't fear that. We should just understand that that's the way it's going to be. In the end, you know, perilous times shall come, the Bible says, and that's where we're at. So let's just, you know, let's do our part to exalt our families and exalt our own lives by lifting up the word of God. <clears throat> let's go ahead and move on here. Look at verse 9. It says, Only take, take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. So God begins here, Moses here is beginning to draw special attention to this particular day. You know, he's telling them, that, look, you need to, you know, don't forget the things that you've seen and heard. You know, teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. You know, and you go on and you read it, and of course he's referring to the fact that God came down in a, in a pillar of fire upon Mount Sinai and gave the law. He says there, and he says, uh, When the Lord said unto me, Gather the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days, that they shall live upon the earth, and they may teach their children. I mean, when God came down, he was trying to make a very strong impression on them. And, and I think he did that. And even to this time, and we were reading about the story. I mean, that's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, is reading about God coming down upon Sinai. And the trumpets, and the and the voice, and the quakings, and the thunders, and the lightning. I mean, it's it's a magnificent story. I mean, I, sometimes when I read it, I just try to imagine myself just being there, you know, in that camp. Maybe maybe some way, you know, you get a big crowd, you maybe not be right up close to the action, but just seeing that from afar, in this crowd, just a pillar of fire coming down on this mountain, the ground shaking under your feet, the thick black clouds, and the and the lightning. That really happened. You know, people saw that. These people saw that happen. <clears throat> he said in verse 11, And he came here and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire under the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. I mean, under the midst of heaven. So here's this fire just coming down and ascent, and going up into these clouds where they, they, it just disappears in the sky. I mean, it's God coming down out of heaven in this pillar of fire upon this mountain. What an amazing sight this must have been. <clears throat> And he goes on in verse 12, And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You know, so it's not just that they saw this. They actually heard God speak. You know, and this is a really, this is a very special thing. God doesn't do this often. In fact, in the old, this is one of the few times you ever see it. I was trying to think about it. The only other time I could think about God speaking from heaven to man was upon the Mount Transfiguration. Where Peter piped up when Jesus was, you know, transfigured. He saw Moses and Elijah. And he said, let us prepare here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and Elijah. And the cloud overshadowed them. And they heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. And what was Peter, what was their reaction? You know, they fell down and they quaked and they were afraid. And Jesus had to come and touch them and tell them not to, to fear not. And then they woke up and they saw no man but Jesus. So, I mean, this is a special thing when you hear God speaking from heaven. I mean, they're hearing God speak out of the midst of the fire. And remember, and he's talking to, you know, millions of people. So to make himself heard, he's got to really be speaking very loud. I mean, it must have been to some just deafening to hear God speak. Have you ever been to any kind of like a public, like a concert or any kind of a, you know, public gathering where there's someone speaking over a, a PA system or something like that? I mean, sometimes that gets really loud. But I don't think anyone's ever heard it as loud as God got that day. I mean, God is just booming his voice. And he says he heard the voice of the words but saw no similitude. Only you heard a voice. You know, and there was a reason for that. You know, we're going to see that here that God really emphasizes this. Like, look, you didn't see anything that day. You didn't see God. You don't know what he looks like. You know, all you heard was a voice. Yeah, you saw all these other things, the fire, the clouds, the lightning, all these other things that, you know, made a strong impression that, that, that God was present. But the only thing that you... Well, that happened. The only thing about God is that you heard him. You didn't see him. You didn't see any similitude, it says there. <clears throat> and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. 
And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you may do them in the land when you go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude. So again, he's bringing this up. He's, you know, he's being repetitive here. He's being redundant. You know, he's saying, look, you didn't see anything. You didn't see anything. You didn't see God. <clears throat> you didn't see any manner of similitude in the day the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. So Moses is drawing real special attention here to the fact, you know, not only to what they did see, you know, he's reminding them, remember everything you did see, all that magnificent sight of the fire and everything. So, yeah, he's bringing, he's drawing their attention to what they did see, but he's also drawing their attention to what the fact that they didn't see something that they didn't see God, that they didn't see his actual similitude. And what he's doing here, the reason why he's emphasizing this point is because he's trying to curb idolatry among the children of Israel. Because this is something that was very prevalent in the land where they were going over to possess. They were idolaters. The Canaanites, you know, they were making, you know, even Egypt that they came out of, idolaters. You know, remember Aaron, he made the golden calf. This is something that they're used to. You know, making things that they call God. These, these statues, these images that they craft, that they mold, that they make, and saying, well, this is God. This be your gods, O Israel. And, and he's here saying, look, you didn't see God. You didn't see God. You saw no similitude. He's driving it home because he wants to curb that. He doesn't want them going into that. I mean, imagine being God. And then, you know, nobody knows, you know, you, know, you have your, your children, and then they make an image. They say, well, this is, this is an image of my dad, and it just looks nothing like you. This is me and my dad. You know, this is a picture of them with some stranger. This is my dad. Look, dad, it's a picture of me and you. You're like, who is that? <laughs> that's not me. Oh, no, it's you. That's you, dad. That's how God, I mean, I mean, God, that's, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to put it down on, on a human level, but think about that with God. You know, you're, we're over, the, Aaron's over there making a golden calf. This is God. You know, and God has never even been seen. I mean, what an insult. What a smack in the face. And it just, you know, it makes you scratch your head. Why does, why does man have to have something tangible like that to call God? <clears throat> it's just, it's, it's very odd. But he, so here he is, he's trying to curb this idolatry. He doesn't want them going back into this idolatry. And that's exactly what happens, isn't it? When they stray, when they forget God, when they leave off God. If they go right into it, they just go right into idolatry like that. And uh, God's trying to curb that, you know, and that's why, you know, we have no accurate depictions of Christ today. You know, that long-haired, blue-eyed hippie that they try to pass off as Jesus, that femi-looking queer, that they say, this is what Jesus looked like. That's not what Jesus looked like. You get, one, how do you know? Well, one, he's got long hair. And the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. So that'd be pretty hypocritical, wouldn't it? And Jesus wasn't a hypocrite. And, you know, the Bible says that he hath no form of comeliness that we should desire him. There was nothing special about his physical appearance when he walked around on this earth. That, and I believe God made sure that nobody, there might have been people who tried to draw it or something or, or, or have some depiction of, G, of Jesus. If they did, I'm sure God made sure it got destroyed some way. You know, some guys following Jesus around, you know, like those courtroom drawings or something like that. He's trying to make a portrait of Jesus and gets it all done and then just bursts into flames or something there. Wind comes and just takes it away and blows it into some lake or something. I mean, God, there are no accurate depictions. All those depictions that we see, those came hundreds of years later after Christ. Hundreds of years. All the people that seen Jesus firsthand were dead and gone. So how do they know what he looked like? They don't, you know. And and it's just funny because they always depict him, you know, as some, you know, the European. Everyone, every nationality depicts Jesus in their own in their own to reflect them. You know, the Europeans have a white Jesus. You know, uh, the black, you have a black Jesus. You know, everyone tries to do it to make him look like him. You know, if you had to guess what color he had, I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us. But I don't think he was blonde haired, blue eyed, and white as the snow. You know, he's from the Middle East. <laughs> so, but, you know, this just goes, shows us that, that God doesn't want us making depictions of, of him. Us saying, oh, this is what God looks like. And Moses here is just driving this in, saying, you saw no similitude, don't make any graven images. He's trying to curb this. <clears throat> because of verse 16. Because he knows what happens when man starts to make these images. He says, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any wicked fowl that flieth in the air, 
the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath them, the earth. And thou lift up, uh, lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and to serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under heaven. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron first, even unto Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. It's so God saying, look, don't make any of these things, because they just go overboard. When they start making every, they make, start making images of everything. You know, every saint has to have a statue now in the Catholic Church. You know, you gotta have, Mary's got to have a statue. You know, you've got to have a statue for Jesus. You've got to have all these images now. And it corrupts people. You know, they, it, it takes them away from the true and living God. They start to worship an actual image, a porcelain, you know, model of whoever it might be. They bow down. They worship. I mean, go, go, go over to India. Go over to these Buddhist countries and watch where they practice, you know, Buddhism and watch them bow down and bring offerings. And, you know, I remember going up in North Phoenix, when, you know, when we had the location up in North Phoenix on 35th Avenue. You know, I'd stop by on Sundays, and we'd go to Rainbow Donuts, and we'd walk in, and over next to the donut case behind the counter, they had their little Buddha with a little tiny thing around it. And there was, I'm not kidding you folks, a cup of coffee and a donut in front of this little Buddha statue. Apparently Buddha likes, likes sprinkled donuts <laughs> and black coffee. And it had been there a while. You know when coffee sits in the cup for a while and starts to evaporate and get that brown stain around the edge? I'm like, it's, yeah, then she made a clue, folks. He's not drinking it. You know? <laughs> it's, it's evaporating. The donut's still whole. You know, say, well, should you have bought those donuts? Well, you know, we understand that an idol is nothing, you know. You know <laughs> let every man, you know, if, 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 if eating this donut offered to an idol caused my brother to offend, I shall eat no donuts, and, you know, on the world standards. But I didn't have a problem with it. I said, as long as you didn't sacrifice that donut to that, you know, you're going to give me, you know, because I see how long you let him stay out there. But it's a perfect example, you know. And I'm not one to turn down a day with donut, you know. Some, some people are, but but it just goes to show you that people they get carried away. They're, they'll say, "Let me bring a donut to my little statue and set it down and worship." This is my God, you know, sitting there next to the broom. I mean, how, you're bringing God down to such a low level. You're the concept and idea of of God, the Creator. Like you could encapsulate God in this tiny little statue. And, and yet you could serve him by, by giving him donut. Now you're providing for this little thing. It's, it's insulting to the true and living God to worship the stars and the heavens and the moon that, you know, that God created. Oh, let me worship the sun. Why don't you worship the one who made that? Let me worship the stars. Well, why don't you worship the one who put every star in its place and knows every single one of them by name? <clears throat> now, in verse 20, he says... But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. And I love that phrase, and I've wanted to preach a sermon about this for so long, this phrase, out of the iron furnace. You know, you guys that might be wanting to write a sermon, there you go. I just gave you one, right? Out of the iron furnace. Go ahead and steal my thunder. Right? But, you know, for, and for the longest time, I couldn't understand what he meant by that. And then I figured it out, and I thought, well, that's... You ever, you ever have something in the Bible, you can't get it, and then, and then later it clicks, and you're like, how did I not understand that? That's so simple. So he says he brought him out of the iron, iron furnace, even out of Egypt. So what's the iron furnace? It's Egypt, right? That's what he's calling Egypt here. He's saying Egypt is the iron furnace. And, you know, he's, he, he, he alludes to Egypt in the same way. I'll read him First Kings. He says, For they be thy people, this is Solomon, you know, dedicating the temple, thy inheritance, which thou brought us forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron. So this is something that, you, that is a phrase that's used to describe Egypt. He calls it an iron furnace, the furnace of iron. So what does he mean by that? Again, you see that same thing in Jeremiah, verse 11, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace. So again and again and again, iron furnace, Egypt. And these things, that's what he's calling Egypt, it's the iron furnace. Now, <clears throat> I try to kind of understand what he meant by that. I'm thinking, okay, the iron part, kind of confusing. Furnace, you know, well, we could kind of, I could kind of see that, you know. Egypt's a hot place. We, we're familiar with that. 
You know, we could we could say, well, you know, Tucson is a bit of a furnace. You know, we we've been brought out of the furnace of Tucson. You know, so I thought, well, maybe that's it. But that doesn't really gel, right? Because it's the iron furnace. So, and really, when you when you get this, it's a perfect description of Egypt. Because what he's what he's uh, reminding us is is that there was no escape for them in Egypt. It was an iron furnace, like iron. There's there's no way out. They're they're in iron. They couldn't penetrate through and escape on their own. There was no way out of this iron furnace. They were stuck there. There's no escape. And he calls it a furnace because of the fact that Egypt was going to consume them. Remember, before God delivered them, they there was a, a rose of Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, and and decided to start. You know, he he doubled their their tasks. You know, he made them make he doubled their tail of bricks. And gave them no straw and said, you are idle. You know, he was looking, he was worried that uh, the Pharaoh then was worried that they were going to, the Israelites would side with their enemies and turn on him. You know, he was, he was, uh, he was a wicked man. He was commanding them to throw their children in the river. Every male child. He's trying to breed them out. He was trying to destroy God's people. So that's why God calls Egypt an iron furnace. There was no escape. And sure enough, eventually it was going to destroy them. You know, you put a metal in, in a furnace and you turn it up hot enough, no matter what element it is, it gets hot enough, that thing's going to melt. That thing's going to get broken down and destroyed and consumed. So that's why he's describing it that way. To remind them of what God delivered them out of. That, that he didn't just, they weren't just, you know, hanging out in some park somewhere when God came along. Egypt wasn't just you know, a dance through the lilies, that they were they were on their way out, that they were going to be snuffed out, they were going to be destroyed in this iron furnace. And God comes along and delivers them, does the impossible, snatches them out of the flame, reaches into the furnace and pulls them out by a strong and mighty hand. And, you know, that should serve a reminder for us too. Because I'll tell you something, the same thing happened for me and you. You know, we, as sinners, without Christ, we're on our way to a, a furnace, a literal furnace called hell, yeah. of which there is no escape. The Bible says that those that are there, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up day and night, and they have no rest forever. Once you're there, you're there. You're stuck, but you are in an iron furnace. So just as God miraculously reaches in and pulls them out of the iron furnace of Egypt, God has done the same thing for us, you know, if we're saved. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Man, when you got saved, you know, you got delivered from the power of darkness. That's, that's powerful. You got delivered through the power of darkness. You've been translated into God's kingdom. God took you from the, that kingdom and put you in his through the blood of Christ. The Bible says in Jude, uh, Jude 1, Keep yourselves in love, God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. You know, we can do the same thing for other people now. We can go out and help other people escape the iron furnace. We can go out and help other people be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. We can go out and help other people be translated into the kingdom of his dear son through the, uh, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know, that's what God has given us. And I believe, you know, that's why God <clears throat> is bringing up Egypt here and describing this manner of the children of Israel to remind them of where they came from and to remind them just how close they were to utter destruction. And we can look back at that and be reminded to us as well. That we, by nature, were children of wrath, and we were this close, one breath, from just slipping off into eternity in a place called hell. So, he goes on there in verse uh, 21. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, and swear that I should not go over Jordan, and that I should not go in unto that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Of course, we covered this last week when He's referring to the fact that you know Moses disobeyed at the rock Oreb and, and smote it twice rather than speaking to it. And God said for that reason, and we talked about how God makes a, a, a leadership accountable even more so. He said, but I must die in this land. And if you recall last week, Moses recounting the story of how he had 
pleaded with God that He would allow it, that He would show him mercy, and that He would allow that He would, you know, retract that judgment and let him go over to the Promised Land. Now we're reading it in this next chapter. It sounds like Moses is resolved. You know, God said at that time, He said, "Speak to me no more of this matter." And now it seems like Moses kind of got it settled. He just said, "You know what? That's now I must die in this land." You know, <laughs> you know, He's not going to change God's mind on it. And uh, you know, that's a good lesson. You know, that when 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 God has determined something, you know, we shouldn't fight it. We should just say, okay, Lord, and make the best of the situation. He says, I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but ye shall go over and possess the good land. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image. So he's make, bringing it up again, these graven images. I mean, that's what this whole chapter just is about. Grave, don't make images. Don't make images. You didn't see his similitude. He just keeps bringing this up. Uh, uh, which he made with you, and make a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. So he's saying, you know what? Don't make these images because, you know, it hurts God's feelings. You know, makes God sad. That's not what he said. He said, because God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. And you, and you say, well, what, how is God a consuming fire? Well, what it's showing us is that God is a God who destroys. God destroys things. I mean, that's what fire does. Fire absolutely goes in and just destroys. I mean, look at the wildfires you see all the time over in California. People don't go back and repair that house that burned to the ground. They have to start all over because the old one is gone. It's destroyed. It's ashes. And the Bible says God is a consuming fire. And he's saying, look, don't, don't make God angry. Don't make these images. You're going to upset him. And God's a fire. And, you know, we should take word and take heed to that as God's people. That, you know, if we just start living flippantly, if we just cast off the things of God, if we just say, oh, the Bible, it's just, it's just a bunch of rules, you know, God's not going to judge me. Better check yourself because God is a consuming fire. Amen. And God will burn you up. Maybe not literally, but he'll, he'll light a flame under you one way or another in your life. And he'll put you in the hot seat to bring you back around. God, God doesn't play games. You know, God wants, you know, God wants to bless his children. God wants to bless his people, but God is not stupid either. And God knows that man is, has a proclivity to go into sin. You know, in this instance, we're reading about making graven images. And that's why he's just trying to hammer this in and say, look, don't make these images. You're going to make God. God's a consuming fire. He'll destroy you because he's a jealous God. Well, why does God get so mad? Because he's jealous. Because this is his people. He's the one that went and delivered them out of the fire. He's the one that went and brought them out of Egypt. He's the one that's going to bring them into this great, wonderful land and bless them. And that's how they're going to, reach, that's how they're going to show their, their gratitude, making some stupid image and say it's God. Wouldn't that make you angry? You know, going back to that illustration as a dad, you're the one providing for this family. You're the one taking care of these kids putting food on the table, house over their head, clothes on their back, and then they're going to go call some other guy, Dad, and say, you're not, oh, that's not really my dad. Man, that would make me mad as a dad. <laughs> We'd figure that one out real quick. We'd find out who Dad is and who Dad isn't in a, in a heartbeat. Because I'd be jealous. You know, I want my kid, kids to love me. I want them to show me that affection. I would be jealous. And the Bible says God is a consuming fire. Yeah, if you, you know, we won't, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but in Deuteronomy 9, it repeats this. It says, Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God uh, is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire, he shall destroy them. And that's why it's likening God unto a consuming fire, because he destroys. <clears throat> and people, you know, they don't like that aspect of God, but that's who God is. God is a creator, God gives life, but he also takes away. And he also builds up, but he also destroys. You know, he's, he's a complex person. He's not just this one-dimensional character. And, and we're warned in the New Testament. You say, well, that's the Old Testament God. Well, we're warned of the same thing about God in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 12, a, a chapter that's all about God chastening his children as a man doth his son. And he closes in verse 28 and says, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom, right, just like the Israelites were receiving a land, a physical land, we also are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, not a temporal dwelling on this earth, but uh, an eternal home in heaven. We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, 
let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. You know, do the things that are right. Live a righteous and holy life for God with reverence and godly fear. We should be afraid of God. And why is it? Because in verse 29 of Hebrews 12 in the New Testament, it says, For our God is a consuming fire. Describes God in the same way in the New Testament. It says, look, we ought to serve God with fear for the same reason, because he's a consuming fire and he destroys. And we can't give this idea that just because we're in the New Testament that we can just be flippant and play games with God and, and, and not obey God and just disregard his commandments and think that nothing bad is going to happen. You'll get burned. God will burn you because he's jealous. And you have to kind of stop and, and define this word jealous because people have have this idea today that jealousy is a bad thing. Jealousy is not a bad thing. If jealousy is a bad thing, then why does God call himself jealous? In fact, if you would, turn over to Exodus, since you're so close in chapter 34, we'll see where God, that's his name. <laughs> God calls himself jealous. He says, hey, I'm a jealous God. Then he goes, you know what, you can call me, hey, jealous. <laughs> I praise thee, O oh, jealous. Look here, verse 34, chapter 34, verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Well, that seems pretty appropriate. If you're a jealous, if you're jealous, you know, why do they call you jealous? Because I'm jealous. <clears throat> and people today, they think, oh, you shouldn't be jealous. What you mean is you shouldn't be envious. You know, there's a difference between envying what isn't yours and then being jealous for what is yours. Yeah. Saying, hey, this is mine and you can't have it. I'm jealous for this. Why? Because it's mine. You can't have it. We should, and that, you know what? We should be jealous for what is rightfully ours. We should be jealous and not let people take things that are, that are near and dear to us. You know, in one particular area we can reapply this in, is in our marriage. Because some people have this misconstrued notion that if, a, if, a, if, if a, a husband or wife is jealous for their spouse, that somehow that's wrong. Look, it's wrong to not be jealous. You know, oh, like I should just let my wife hang out with other guys and just be okay with that. There's people, this is the philosophy that's out there. Like she should have some other friends that are men and she should go bowling. Or, I don't know, you like bowling? I don't know. Actually, we, we fell in love bowling, so. That's the only reason she likes bowling, because I was there, right? Or whatever, maybe she joins a chess club or, you know, I don't know. What, but whatever area, she just starts, you know, having some, some boyfriends, some man friends around. I'm just supposed to sit back and have a nice night, honey. I'll be here when you get back. You think that's going to happen? No way, man. I'm going to be jealous. And there's nothing wrong with it. There'd be something wrong. Doesn't that just seem completely out of place? If I wasn't jealous and said, oh, go have a nice time. You know, where's that going to lead? You know? Well, God understood where it took his people into, into spiritual adultery. Worshiping other gods, loving other gods, having affections for false gods. God, same thing happened with your spouse. You know, yeah, go ahead, honey, go chat on the phone, look up your old high school sweetheart on Facebook and, and, and strike up a conversation. You don't know where that's going to lead. Rekindle some old flame or something like that. Don't even go there. Be jealous for your spouse. And there's nothing wrong with it. You know, make that your name if you need to. Hey, I'm jealous. You start calling me jealous around the house. You know? It might maybe we need to do that a little bit with our with our kids, you know. Keep them out of the dad's snacks. You know, I'm jealous for those snacks, you know. My Pringles, my mix. No, I'm just kidding now. But there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Being jealous for what's rightfully yours, you know. We should be jealous for our God. We should be jealous, and not let other people try to, you know, put God down or tell us we can't worship God the way we ought to. And uh, you know, God's a jealous God. And he's, and you know what? Here's the thing. God's jealous for you. If you're his child, God is jealous for you tonight. So why does God get angry and become a consuming fire? Why will God rain, uh, cloud up and rain on you if you start wandering off into the world? Because God's jealous for you. Because if you're born again, he shed his blood for you. You are not your own, the Bible says. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your members. And God, you know, he, he gets jealous over what's rightfully his. And if you're saved, the Bible's clear, ye are not your own, you're God's. And you think he's just gonna, you're just going to let you just take, take your members and wander off and do whatever wicked sin you want, and God's just going to not be jealous about it. 
you got another thing coming. Because this is the same God all the way through the, the Bible. All the way from Deuteronomy to Hebrews. Jealous of his people. But let's move on here. we got a little bit more to get through. In verse 25, he says, When thou shalt beget children and children's children, you shall remain long in the land and shall corrupt yourselves. He's talking about, like, it's going to happen, because it is. And shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image or the likeness of anything, that, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land, whereunto you go over to the Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve a, a, a gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. I need to read that to those people up there at Rainbow Donuts. But if thou, if, now I want you to paint all the ifs that are coming up here, okay? But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thine heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, all these things are come upon thee. And in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord God is a merciful God. God is very jealous, but God is also very merciful. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. You know what this tells me is that God's covenant with Israel was conditional upon their obedience to him. That they didn't just have a license to do whatever they want. I mean, it's just clear as day in the scripture. And we see this play out in the history of the children of Israel. They go into idolatry, and God takes them out of the land, destroys them, and they're few in number, and scatters them among the heathen. And then when they get right in Babylon, right? They get right, they call upon the name of the Lord, they, they want to obey God, and God brings them back into the land. But it was all conditional upon their obedience if thou shalt seek the Lord thy God if thou seek him with all thy heart if thou turn to the Lord thy God not just you know God's going to destroy you and then just one day you know in your heathen backslidden wicked state God's just going to miraculously bring you back to the land and you and there you will continue to blaspheme Christ and deny the Lord God of the Bible and God's going to bless you the Bible doesn't teach that and and you know these Zionist Christians need to get this through their heads that this is a conditional promise. And God does it because of the covenant with, that he made with thy fathers, which he swear unto them. But it's conditional upon their obedience. And again, that's a big topic. Whole sermons can be preached on that. Let's go to verse 32. For ask now the days that are past, which went before thee, since the day that, the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other, whether there hath been any such thing as, as this great thing is, or hath been heard like it. So he's saying, look, you need to stop and consider how unique this is, what God is doing here with you. There's nothing, this has never happened before. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of fire, as thou hast heard and live? He's saying, that's never happened before. What you saw at Horeb, that's never happened before. Or hath God essayed to go and take him a nation from out of the midst of another nation, by temptations, by signs, by wonders, and by war, and a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So that's never happened before. It's unprecedented. And it's never happened since, where God just goes in and plucks them out of that iron furnace like he did, and just brings them out with miracles and temptations and great signs, and then speaks to them out of the voice, uh, out of the fire. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. You see, you know why God did all that? So that you would know who God is. There is none else beside him. Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice, that he might instruct thee. And upon earth he showed thee this great, his great fire, and thou heardest his words out of the midst of fire. You know, God, this is a very unique thing. Now, now this is now, he's saying, look, this has never happened. Go, he says, look from one heaven to the end of earth to the other under the whole of heaven. Has this ever happened before? And the answer is no. And it's never happened since. But you know what? As I was reading this, I was thinking, it's going to happen again one day. One day God is going to deliver his people again by a mighty stretched out hand. You know who it's going to be? It's going to be us. Amen. If we live under the coming of the Lord, the God is going to do the same thing. He's going to deliver us you know, in the rapture, out of the midst of an iron furnace, out of another nation that is seeking to destroy us. In the great tribulation, God is going to deliver his people. 
And that, you know, that's, that's, uh, that, that, when else has that ever happened? I mean, that's a very unique and special thing. And, uh, and the reason why he did that was to make them hear his voice. And, you know, and God wasn't just speaking because he likes to hear himself talk. God, it says he made it hear his voice that he might instruct thee. You know, God piped up and had something to say, and you had some directions. He had some commandments. He had some do's and don'ts. God wanted to instruct them and wanted them to know who it was that was speaking. And what this does, you know, this, this is an amazing thing that they did, but, you know, and truly it was, but you know what it did? It made them more accountable. It made them more accountable because of the fact that they saw all these things, these unprecedented things that have never happened before. They witnessed all of them. And that, so that now they're even more accountable because there's no denying this is the Lord God. Because this never happened before. None of these other, you know, these, 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 these false gods which can't hear or speak, they can't do any of the things that God did. They're dead. They're not even alive. And God did all these things for them, and he made them accountable. Now look there in verse 37. And because he loved thy fathers, he's referring to Isaac, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't because he loved you so much. It's because he made a covenant with his, your fathers that he loved. Therefore he chose their seed after them and brought thee out in, and brought thee out in his sight with mighty power out of Egypt to drive out nations from before thee, greater and mightier than thou art, to bring thee in, to give thee their land as an for an inheritance as it is this day. I love verse 39. I've loved this verse. This is one of the first verses I ever memorized. Know therefore this day, consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. You know, if you know the true and living God, you know the only God there is. Okay. You know, if you know the Lord God in heaven above, you know the only God there is. There is nobody else. There is no other option. He is the only God. <clears throat> what a blessing that we know him. He goes on in verse 40 and he says, Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I keep thee this day, that it may go well with thee. So does God just have rules because he just likes making up, make, like, making life difficult? This guy's just an old fuddy duddy, doesn't want anybody to have any fun. No, it's for our own good. Because you know what? There is pleasure in sin for a season, but there's also the consequences that come with sin. And you have to pay the piper. You know, you have to pay the price. Like Pastor Anderson was saying about, you know, uh, um, Jonah when he went when he started to backslide from God. He had to pay the toll thereof, right? There's a price to pay for sin. You don't just get away with it. And the reason why God gave statutes and commandments and which can, and commanded them that it may go well with thee. You know, if we keep God's commandments and we keep God's statutes, it's going to go well for us. You know, and I can testify to that. You know, and, and I never want to get up and try to glorify the past and say that, you know, I'm something special because I lived a, a sinful life in the past because we've all had sin in our lives. But here's the thing, like, I, I know what it's like to live without God. I know what it's like to live a contrary to his commandments. I know what it's like to live contrary to God's statutes, and it's not fun. It's not, what, it's not the picture the world paints for you and says, oh, you just come and, you know, be a fornicator and be a drunk and, and covet and just chase money. And life will be great. Life will be miserable. Yep. And, and, and what you see on TV and the movies, it's fake. It's not real. It's a lie. And the happiest, I'll tell you what, even at the worst points in my Christian life are still better than some of my highest points in my unsaved life. As, even in the lowest points of my, unsa of my saved life as a Christian, they've never been as low as when I was, wasn't saved. Because we have high and low points. I'm not saying that, you know, just because you got saved, all of a sudden, you know, life is just going to be, you know, the sky's the limit. It's just this rocket ship ride to, to heaven. You know, there's ups and downs in the Christian life. But I'll tell you what, the, the lows in the Christian life, they're not nowhere near as bad as the lows in the unsaved life or a worldly life. And I've never had to, you know, suffer the consequences uh, of sin like I did when I was living in it purposefully as, as an unsaved person. So again, you know, God, he doesn't just make up these rules to just be a, be a downer. It'll go well with thee. And who doesn't want that for their life? Who doesn't want their life to go well? I mean, who doesn't want to get to the end of their life and be able to say, life went well for me? No one wants to get to the end of their life and say, life was, was hard. 
Life was difficult and, and there was no pleasure in it and it was miserable, you know? And it, I failed at it. No one says that. They wanted to get to the end of life and say, you know what, life went well for me. Yeah, it had its ups and downs, it had its difficulties, but by and large, it went well for me. Well, why? Because I got, kept God's commandments, because I kept the statutes. God, you look at God's commandments and the statutes. They're there to protect you. They're there to keep, keep us right with one another. And, you know, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. You know, the, 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 the greatest commandment of all, you know, is love the Lord thy God with all thy whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And if we do that, you know, we're going to have a good life. And the purpose of God's commandments is to benefit us. You should always remember that. It's for our own good. Just like the rules that parents lay down in the house. It's not so they can just, because they, they want to be tyrants. They think they take out the trash. Oh, you poor thing, you know. Maybe it's because they're teaching you that, hey, you know, life isn't all fun and games. That you got to work. And you got to pull your weight in this world. They're doing it for, to benefit you. And plus, you know, we've taken out the trash long enough. <laughs> it's your turn now. But then, you know, he goes on in verse 41, and he says, Then Moses, Moses severed three cities on this side, Jordan, toward the sun rising, that the slayer might flee thither. So this is getting him the cities of refuge. You don't really have a lot of time to get into this. But God's rule was, you know, that if a man accidentally killed somebody, it wasn't intentional murder. You know, it wasn't like first-degree murder where he plotted to kill somebody. It was an accident. It was manslaughter. Rather than that man dying... He was to flee into one of these cities into the death of the high priest, lest the avenger of blood should slay him. And it was really, it was just like a cool off. It was allowing that person to have a bit of a cool off period. And it wasn't, he was, that guy was not allowed to go in and avenge that blood. That man was allowed to live in that city, in these cities. And he says, uh, 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 that the slayer might flee thither, which uh, would kill his neighbor unawares and hated him not in times past. And that fleeing into one of these cities he might live, namely Bezer in the wilderness and the plain country and the Reubenites and Ramoth and Gilead and the Gadites and Golan and Bashan of the Manassites. And this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel. So this is referring to what we just read. This is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel after they came forth out of Egypt on this side Jordan in the valley over against Beth Peor in the land of Sion, king of the Amorites, who, they, who dwelt at Heshbon whom Moses and the children of Israel smote after they came forth out of Egypt. So this isn't all the law, right? Because Deuteronomy is just getting started. <laughs> There's a whole lot more to come of the law. You know, but this is the portion of the law that God taught, that Moses taught to the children of Israel on this side, Jordan, before they passed over. So stick with us, you know, because again, you say Deuteronomy, oh, come on. The statutes and the commandments and the law, yeah, you know why we should learn them and, and take and, 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 and listen to what God has to say in the book of Deuteronomy? Then it might go well with thee. Amen. That's why we should understand not just this portion of the law, but all of that which is to come. Let's go ahead and pray.